This is the Pentagon. Inside these walls, our military planners develop strategic and tactical plans. At least I hope they do. You don't want to become embroiled in a conflict without some predetermined rules of engagement. Some planning can be based on what's worked in the past. But adaptations have to be made because desert warfare is different than jungle warfare. Each adversary is different, too, and understanding their likely responses is critical. The way tactical plans can evolve is through the use of war games. We have to understand how the enemy is likely to react in as many cases as we can envision. If we do this, they will do what? What is our best retaliatory response to their actions in any given situation? What assets do we have to deploy, and where should we position them? The goal of war games is to experience every imaginable situation before we encounter them. That way our response can be pre-planned rather than reactive. This is the lesson for pilots. I will present the case that you should go through a process like war games to mentally prepare for an engine out encounter on takeoff. I'm going to step through the process I've done, something I hope I will never need, still something I've taken the time to anticipate. This is a satellite view of my home airport, Pickens County Airport in Jasper, Georgia. Although it's true that I fly cross-country into other fields, my home base is where most of my takeoffs occur. I think it would be irresponsible to myself, my passenger, my plane, and to people on the ground to not have prepared for the case where an engine fails on takeoff at this field. Runways here are 1634, with runway 34 being the most commonly used. I've highlighted the runway with an arrow to show the direction of flight. So, what's the plan? There are several plans, because there are several different circumstances that require a different response. Based on my own personal experience in my RV-12, if the engine failure occurs less than 300 feet AGL, my plan is to attempt to land straight ahead and stay within the airport boundary. I get up to 300 feet pretty quick with lots of the 5,000 foot runway left ahead onto which I can set down. Plus, there's this overrun area beyond the paved section of the runway I can use to stop in as well. 300 feet AGL is 1,800 feet MSL, a reminder of the limit for this plan. So, for a low-level power out, I plan to use full flaps, 65 knots, and slipping as needed to get safely on the ground. My reaction to the loss of power will need to be near instantaneous, so it's good to review this plan just before takeoff to be mentally prepared. From 300 feet to 700 feet AGL, I may have too much height to remain within the airport boundary, so a new plan kicks in. One option is to land straight ahead in the clearing adjacent to the self-storage warehouses at the tip of the arrow. That's a short space in which to land, but it's a better alternative than into a tree or a house. This probably means sacrificing the airplane, unless I get really lucky. But, if I'm closer to the 700 feet level, maybe with a turn to the right I can make it to the grassy area next to the four-lane highway. So, for engine out below 2200 feet MSL, or 700 feet AGL, that becomes the plan. The last part of the plan becomes a bit controversial. Not everybody is going to agree with me. What I'm about to describe is based on my experience with my RV-12 IS. Not talking about a Skyhawk, not talking about a Cherokee. But on every takeoff, I fly VY or 75 knots all the way to pattern altitude. I'm at 700 feet AGL or better at the end of the runway, the point shown on this photo. This is where I usually turn crosswind. I'm just 300 feet shy of pattern altitude. If a problem happens here, I'll do the so-called impossible turn, and I'll make it too. Here's the plan. Assume we have a wind from the left of the center as shown here. Engine out, I'm going to turn into the wind as shown. If the wind is from the right of center, I'll turn right. I'm going to slow down to 65 knots. I'm going to fly into the wind for a bit. The reason for this is to get off to the side of the runway so I don't have to bank sharply for the turn back. I don't plan to lower the flaps yet. At some point, based on judgment at the time, I'll start a sweeping right turn to glide back to the runway. The crosswind may cause me to overshoot the runway center line, but that's okay. I just want to be careful not to overbank. 
Flaps as required and even slipping as needed, I will get back to the runway for a downwind landing. Workload permitting, I'll call out my plan to any aircraft in the pattern or on the ground. Remember now, an aircraft in distress has the right of way over all other aircraft. Now this is the opposite end of the runway, runway 16, as shown by this directional arrow. In much the same way as described earlier, below 300 feet AGL, the engine out procedure will be a landing straight ahead, staying within the airport boundary. There is little to no overrun at the departure end of the runway, seen here. Now if I lose an engine before making the turn to crosswind, the only viable procedure is a left turn to shoot for the median between the lanes on the highway shown. And if I have achieved 700 feet AGL before an engine failure, I will do the turn back to the airport in the same way I described earlier. This is the takeoff checklist for my RV-12. With the passenger on board, I do brief them in layman's terms about the takeoff, the winds, turns we're going to make, direction we're going to head, altitude we will climb to. I don't frighten them with an engine failure procedure, but I do review them in my mind. That, for me, is the war game. I think every pilot should have such a game plan, if nowhere else, then certainly at their home base. So I hope this video has been of use to you, and it may spur you to consider making a plan of your own. And like me, I hope it's a plan you never have to put into motion. So stay tuned to this channel for more aviation-related goodies to follow. Hope to see you then.